Thank you for joining us on Coffee Break, brought to you by the Middle Alabama Area Agency on Aging, or M4A. M4A is a part of a network of 13 area agencies on aging that cover all 67 counties across the state. We are located in Alabaster, and we cover Blunt, Chilton, Shelby, St. Clair, and Walker counties. We would love to find out how we can help your family today. For previous episodes of Coffee Break, feel free to check out our YouTube channel. All right, we're going to go ahead and kick things off. I uh, want to welcome everybody into Coffee Break. This is session number 19. So if you've if you've not had the opportunity to join us in the past, we want to welcome you if this is your first time. We've been doing these for going on about a year now. Uh, and this is streaming live on Facebook as well. So for, you, for those of you that are not in the Zoom room with us, we hope the next time you'll actually join in with us here instead of being out in the, uh, the Facebook world, but that's fine too. And um, just know that you know, as far as RSVP registrations and questions, we've got a Q&A feature here in the Zoom. So there's a little bit of a benefit to actually being in the Zoom room, of course, but we're always welcome to have those in our social media world as well. So we'll go ahead and kick things off. Again, this is session 19. Uh, we've listed this as loving your heart from the inside out. We're kind of continuing our, our efforts here of, of heart healthiness. And so uh, again, coffee break is a collaborative effort brought to you by two of M4A, or the Middle Alabama Area Agency on Aging, two of our in-house programs. We'll go over M4A a little bit more towards the end of this presentation, but it is brought to you by two of our in-house programs, the Panda Project, as well as our Alabama Cares Caregiver Support Program. All right, so we are excited to welcome back, for those of you who joined us last month, we were also joined by Ms. Carolyn Strickland, as well as Dr. Strickland, uh, and they have joined us again. They are coming from the Montgomery area. And so we are really excited to have them on again. They did such an excellent job last time. We had a lot of great feedback. We hope that you enjoy their presentation today. Of course, uh, again, we're, we'll kind of go over this towards the end, but we do record all of these. So we're recording this live right now. Afterwards, we will be able to kind of put this up on our YouTube channel. So with that being said, you know, we have the last month's already on our YouTube channel now. We also have it on our Facebook feeds. If you can kind of want to scroll back through and find that, it was an excellent presentation and I'm sure today's will be uh, no, no different for sure. Uh, so without anything else to talk about, uh, well, I guess I do need to mention, again, we do have a Q&A box. If you have any questions that pop up as well as a chat feature, so be sure to use those as we go through. If you have any questions pop up, we will definitely make sure we get those, those questions answered whether it's either by Dr. Strickland or Ms. Carolyn or our M4A staff, so. Yeah, so, look, <laughs> I, so I've, I've got my own disclaimer as well. Um, just look, I, I'm not your personal physician. I am a physician that cares very much about you, but that's very different from being your own personal physician. Please don't go against your personal physician's advice based on what I'm telling you today. Please don't stop any medications that you're on without consulting with your physician. Um, and if I talk into changing or improving your diet, one especially important thing to look out for is if you're on a blood thinner called warfarin or coumadin, changing the amount of greens that you're taking in can really affect how much it thins your blood. And it would be very important to check your blood thinning test perhaps a little bit more often immediately after a change in your diet. Now, um, that said, you know, let's talk about today about the power of food. And the food choices you make really has the power to prevent heart attacks today and prevent you from getting dementia in the future. Um, kind of an outline of what we're going to talk about. I'm going to talk about the anatomy and the structures of the heart, both at a large level and also a very, very small microscopic level. We'll talk about a few concepts about what's going on in there. Um, we'll, and then we'll slowly work our way up to a heart attack. And, and once we've talked our way through to that heart attack, then we'll start talking about the good news about how you can avoid these, um, these bad outcomes. And at the end, you know, you know, I know that Alzheimer's and dementia is really a central issue for this group. And uh, we'll, we'll touch on how these issues that I'm talking about today 
connect to dementia. So February is Heart Health Month. So the heart gets to take center stage today. You know, this is a picture of the heart. Um, you know, certainly much more colorful than it is in real life. But I'd really draw your attention to those bright red lines going down the sides of the heart. You know, your body really depends on those. Those are the coronary arteries and your body depends on them. If the blood flow gets blocked off, bad things happen, and we'll talk about those bad things as we go. In better understanding the coronary arteries and how they're important, let's cut the heart in half, and we're gonna cut it in half right along where that line is. And when you cut it in half and you look at it, um, you, the center white areas is where the blood would be, and then the brown area around the brown circles that brown is where the heart muscle is. Now, in medical school, we learn to put the left on the right and the right on the left. It's part of this higher education thing, right? It's meant to be, it's meant to be that it's as if I'm looking at you. If you as a person are in front of me, I see your right shoulder on the left. I see your left shoulder on the right. It's kind of meant to be the same thing. Now, an interesting thing, I. I when I first started thinking about blood supply to the heart, you know, before I really got any training, I thought, well, shoot, the, the heart is full of blood. Blood supply to the heart should be really easy. I mean, it should just be able to seep in from the inside, shouldn't it? Well, it winds up that it can't. And it can't because the heart muscle is generally about 12 millimeters thick. That's about half an inch. Um, but the blood can only penetrate from the inside into the heart muscle about one one hundredth of a millimeter or one two thousand five hundredths of an inch. I'm, you know, it's just a, such a small amount that it can penetrate that it, it's really kind of ridiculous to think that you could get blood supply from the inside. And yeah, I take it just because of the way evolution turned out that or the way our design turned out that they there wasn't success at having piping starting from the inside so your blood supply really comes from the outside in and it comes from the outside in through these coronary arteries i've got three the three main coronary arteries on this on this picture they're the red circles at the bottom the top and the left of this picture and those are the coronary arteries and let's hone in on that coronary artery on the bottom. Let's zoom in on that a little bit. And as you look at a little bit more closely, you see that that coronary artery has branches. They're going into the heart muscle. And as you look closer still, those branches get to be smaller and smaller and smaller until the tiniest blood vessels at the tip, those are the capillaries. But I hope you can see how that heart muscle in that area would really be dependent on that blood flow. Um, if the blood flow gets blocked off to in that main coronary artery that's there, all of that area of the heart that's dependent on that blood flow is going to die. This is an actual cardiac catheterization, an image of a pretty normal coronary artery, and you can see how those branches are reaching down into the heart. Now, in this picture, you can't really tell what's spreading on the outside of the heart and what's reaching in, but some of those blood vessels that you're seeing here are reaching in. And I hope you see how it has really kind of that tree-like structure I was describing, and it goes on down to teeny tiny blood vessels, um, you know, as small as what can be seen on a picture like this. So, and remember those capillaries are what are the smallest branches. And those capillaries are very important, um, but it's, an, it's amazing how tiny they are. They're much, much, they're about one hundredth the diameter of a hair. They're just about, and those branches, there'll be one capillary right next to another to the point that there's only about 20 micrometers between each pair of capillaries. Um, in one cubic millimeter of heart, there will be 2,500 capillaries. And what I want you to understand is that this blood supply is really intensely designed and it's precious. I, and I'd, I'd really encourage you to really take care of your blood vessels. It wouldn't be so intensely designed if it wasn't so important, if it wasn't so necessary. 
So the coronary artery, remember that area that's supplied by that tree of blood vessels, those branches and branches of blood vessels, it really depends on that coronary artery, that big red dot that's down at the bottom. Now let's look at that coronary artery a little bit more closely. And the way we're gonna look at it is gonna be like if we're looking at a pipe. If we cut a pipe in half and we look down that pipe and saw that circle, that's what we're gonna be looking at. So this is a perfectly normal coronary artery. You know, it, it's got a little bit of muscle or a little bit of lining and um, you know, it's wide open. This is the way the coronary artery might be in the womb. And I, I say might be. Um, then after that, cholesterol starts building up. How soon does it start building up? Yeah, this was a challenging question. We got a really kind of shocking answer a few years back. They actually did an autopsy series on 10-year-olds, and they found that 10-year-olds have some buildup of cholesterol in their coronary arteries. We give them hamburgers, we give them hot dogs. Uh, it's got consequences, and that's when coronary artery disease starts until we had a more recent study that actually showed that there's a little bit of cholesterol buildup in newborns. When, they're, when their mother has a lot of fatty food, it seems to have an impact. It, that cholesterol actually starts building up even before you're born. Now, we, I think we all kind of know the usual course of things. More and more cholesterol builds up as you get older. And this buildup of cholesterol in the lining of the coronary artery, well, it's also built up in other arteries, but that's called a cholesterol plaque. It could also be called an atherosclerotic plaque when it's happening in, in all of the blood vessel and not just where it's built up there. It's called arteriosclerosis or atherosclerosis. We often think about that plaque, but you know, the whole lining of that blood vessel is having some of the impact of this process. And when we look at that plaque a little bit more carefully, what do you see? Um, you see all that cholesterol that's in there um, but you also see your body's reaction to that cholesterol. Your body is upset that it's there. It tries to heal things. It tries to make it better. And when you look at that plaque under a microscope, you'll find inflammatory and repairing cells there. That's what I have on there is the blue dots. And, and then you'll also see a lot of scar and and this connective tissue that's essentially scar. And that's what I've got there is these kind of gray squiggly lines that, and that's kind of the way it looks. And it's this complex mixture. And what that'll be called is an atherosclerotic plaque. Um, athero, meaning blood vessel, sclerotic, meaning scar. And it's scar because of the, it's, it's basically the, what's left behind from your body desperately trying to repair and kind of fighting a battle to repair it. That really leaves the scar tissue that's in there. So just how does this look in normal, in real life? You know, this is a normal coronary artery. You see, it's got that lining that is some, um, you know, there's cells and there's other things in that lining that are doing their job. This is about the way it looks when it's normal, nice and big and open in the middle, uh, you know, pretty much a circle. And this is an atherosclerotic coronary artery. And you see all this gunk built up on the right side of this picture. And you see how there's a, a lot of mixture of colors and textures. You know, it's that atherosclerotic plaque, it's a real complex mix of you know, sludge and gunk. So how does this buildup happen? And then why does a heart attack happen? And can you prevent that from happening? And once you've got that build up there, can you heal? That's what we'll try to cover right now. Um, a thing to understand is that plaque is not just sitting there. It's lined by a semi-permeable membrane. That thin black line that's, that is surrounding the white area there, that is a, uh, a semi-permeable membrane. It'll keep some things in that blood vessel but then it allows other things to travel um, back and forth across that membrane. Uh, now, as stuff enters that plaque, it'll gradually grow and grow and grow over time. So LDL cholesterol is really the bad guy here. 
And as long as that LDL cholesterol is higher than 70 to 130, that plaque is going to grow. More LDL cholesterol is going to enter the plaque than what leaves the plaque, and the plaque is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, why is that important? It's because we know that plaques that are taking up about 40 to 60% of the blood vessel are the ones that are really unstable. They're the ones that are most likely to bust open and cause a heart attack. Um, the other thing that's really important with this is you'll get surges of cholesterol, surges of cholesterol entering that plaque. And that happens with fatty meals. Whenever you eat meat of any variety, whether it's chicken, turkey, beef, pork, fish, uh, cheese, dairy products, eggs, any of those will enter that plaque as a surge of LDL cholesterol. Um, I should say something about oils as well. It doesn't have, a plant-based oil wouldn't have cholesterol in it, but it can have saturated fats, which can be converted into LDL cholesterol and can enter that plaque as well. So the ideal diet would exclude the oils. So why are these surges of cholesterol important? They did this great study a few years back. Um, I got, I've learned about this through nutritionfacts.org if, if you wanted to go and see the information for yourself. But they did this great experiment where they took some of this cholesterol that was dissolved in a test tube. And what they did after that is they started putting in drops of really highly concentrated cholesterol into that test tube. And the amazing thing that happened when they added one more drop is that the cholesterol crystallized and the, the cholesterol crystals took up more space than the dissolved cholesterol. And all of a sudden the cholesterol mixture expanded and it starts flowing out the top of the tube. It was like an eruption. Now you've probably seen this happen before in real life because this is really exactly what happens. If you put a, when you put a jar or a container of water in the freezer, you seal it up, you put it in the freezer, liquid water does not take up as much space as crystallized water. Crystallized water is ice. So when it goes from water to ice, the, what is in there expands. And if it's in a sealed container, it's gonna bust open the container. The LDL cholesterol does basically the same thing. So remember these drawings with the cholesterol plaque at the bottom, when you, have, when you have that unfortunate moment where you have that one more surge of LDL cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol crystallizes, it takes up more space, it busts out, um, it busts open the membrane and busts into the artery where the blood is. And your body, that'll take up some space in that artery. And then your body will have a response to it, trying to come in re and repair it and plug the leak. And, but that response, it takes up space too, and it suddenly clogs up the blood vessel. And all of a sudden the blood flow stops and all of the heart muscle that was dependent on that blood vessel will lose its blood supply and very likely die. This is what this actually looks like in real life. Um, if you can tell, this is a blood vessel again. The bottom left half of, the, of what should be the inside of the blood vessel is filled up with that atherosclerotic plaque. And from that plaque where there's a black star in the middle, that's where there's been an eruption into the, into the blood vessel, into where the blood should be, where there's been a rupture in that, of the cap of that atherosclerotic plaque. Now, in this drawing, there's a whole lot more um, thrombus, clot, and reaction to this than there is uh, the eruption. But I hope you can see how it pretty much looks like what I was um, what I was drawing for you in those previous slides. So remember, this is the coronary artery and the heart muscle is dependent on the blood. And when that heart, when that coronary artery gets blocked off, the heart muscle that's dependent on that blood supply is very likely going to die. And that's a heart attack. Now, these cor this coronary artery disease, these heart attacks, they very often hit close to home. This is a slide that, from a presentation made at UAB. 
And what they pointed out is that people that eat a Southern diet more often than others will have a 56% higher risk of heart disease, of heart attacks like I'm describing. They'll have a 56% greater risk compared to people that eat the Southern diet a whole lot less often. Southern diet referring to fried chicken and things like that. Um, now that's that's 56% greater risk compared to people that are still eating that diet a lot of the time. You can improve your risk much, much more than that by improving your diet further. So just in review, we've talked about how a heart attack happens. We've talked about how the LDL cholesterol and cholesterol in general builds up in that plaque, how the plaques get big enough to be unstable, how a surge of LDL cholesterol causes the cholesterol in that plaque to crystallize, how the plaque ruptures, and between that rupture and your body's response, that blood vessel suddenly gets blocked off and the heart muscle dependent on that heart, uh, dependent on that blood vessel will die. But now, you know, let's talk about the good news because uh, the good news is very strong. It's very powerful. Um, you have the power to choose. Only animal products have that cholesterol. Um, plant-based products, plant-based foods do not have the cholesterol. You could just choose to not have them. Um, if you don't have them, the chances of, your heart, of you having a heart attack or a stroke, they, they drastically decrease. Um, remember that large, unstable plaque that was already taking up 40 to 60% of the blood vessel? If there's no surge of LDL cholesterol, it's not going to, it's very, very unlikely to erupt. Um, in, in addition, that plaque can shrink. Remember that was a semi-permeable membrane. If the LDL cholesterol in the blood is low, if it's lower than somewhere around 70 to 100, gradually more and more cholesterol is going to leave the plaque than what enters the plaque. And that plaque is going to gradually shrink back. And um, and the, that plaque can get smaller and smaller and smaller to where it's much, much more stable, much less likely to erupt and cause that heart attack. Now, a lot of people can achieve these goals with diet alone. Some people require medicine plus diet. There's some people that can achieve these goals with medication alone, but honestly, from, not, from what I've seen in my practice, people that continue eating whatever they're called to eat, continue eating, for instance, the Southern diet, um, and try to beat it with just medicines, it's pretty rare that we really get all the way to our goals with medication alone. Um, I'd really encourage you to go as far as you can with your diet and based on your doctor's advice, supplement that with medication. Uh, I wanted to show you some slides just pointing out the proof. I mean, what's showing you visually what you, you can accomplish with improving your diet. These are some slides. These are a couple slides from Dr. Kim Williams. He's the former president of the American College of Cardiology. He's uh, at Rush University up in uh, um, up in Chicago. And in this top pair of pictures, you can on the right where the arrow is pointing to it, you can see where that coronary artery is kind of narrowed a little bit. Um, on the right. On the right on that pair of pictures where that arrow is, you can see how that very same coronary artery without medication, just with improving the diet, moving to a plant-based diet, that coronary artery opened up again. And as I understand it, this was after just a few weeks of a plant-based diet. Uh, in the bottom right, there's another pair of slides that shows a very similar thing where there's some narrowing in a coronary artery where that arrow is on the picture on the left. And then that very same artery opens up after a few weeks of a plant-based diet. These are some slides from one of the real pioneers, one of the great leaders in this realm, um, Caldwell Esselstein. Uh, you could get some of this information from his website. Uh, on the, we'll start on the right. You can see what's kind of bracketed by that curved white line is a coronary artery that was just really, really ratty, really blocked up, um, really looks in danger of getting totally occluded. Now, this was after a longer time. This was after 32 months of a plant-based diet. You can see that coronary artery, I mean, it's normal. I mean, it, that's just amazing. 
And it's not just one little spot. It's that whole thing, that whole stretch of coronary artery that was, that was at risk is really gone to being totally normal. Now on the left, what these more colorful images are, um, this is a nuclear imaging study of the heart. It's a nuclear imaging study. By nuclear, it's using some things that you can, that emit a little bit of radiation to where you can see them on special uh, pictures, x-ray type things. And uh, at the top, you can see where, where the brighter red is where there's really good blood supply. They can tell with this test that there's a lot of blood getting to that area. The yellow areas, there's not as much blood supply. And the areas that are more gray, there's hardly any blood supply getting there at all. That area is really at risk for having a heart attack. Uh, then in the bottom screen, and if you can, I'm not sure how well you can see on the caption, but this is after just three weeks of a plant-based diet you can tell that there's a lot more of that deep red and a lot more of that yellow. That gray area that was in danger is now getting good blood supply. Um, this is just an amazingly strong difference. Um, so something to understand though, is that this atherosclerosis, it's not just in the blood, blood vessel supply in the heart. Now in, in the heart, we think of it causing heart attacks, but it's also causing buildup and decrease in blood, blood supply all over where it's just that cholesterol's just build up, had those atherosclerotic plaques, they're impeding but not totally stopping flow. There are things like ischemic cardiomyopathy where the heart is getting blood but not enough blood, so it's still alive but not enough to do its job very well. That's called ischemic cardiomyopathy or at least one aspect of ischemic cardiomyopathy, cardio meaning heart, myopathy meaning a problem with the muscle of the heart, um, ischemic meaning a lack of blood flow. Now, the very same things happen in the brain where there's flat out strokes and a whole lot of dementia and brain problems are because there's several areas in the brain that have had strokes, sometimes small strokes, sometimes small strokes that nobody really knows when they happened, uh, but, you know, the, but the accumulated effect of them is that the person's changed. Um, now, it can also be part of dementia where there's a lot of the brain that is just, it's getting enough blood flow to stay alive, but it's not getting enough to really thrive and do its job very well. So uh, just trying to convince you that atherosclerosis plays a big role with dementia. Um, what they found is that when, somebody, when they see atherosclerosis in the blood vessels in the brain, it doubles the risk of that 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 person is going to progress on to have Alzheimer's disease or dementia. The amount of the atherosclerosis seen in those blood vessels is proportional to how much their mental performance is going to worsen over time. And um, so the more atherosclerosis, the more likely they are to progress to worse memory problems. The less atherosclerosis, the less likely they're going to progress. And also a total cholesterol of 250 or higher, that about triples the risk, the chances that that person is going to develop Alzheimer's in their lifetime or dementia. Um, so remember that heart muscle, it really depends on those coronary arteries. In the same way, you know, we could have drawn very similar blood vessels like the, the carotid arteries and the cerebral arteries that are on up in the skull. You could have drawn the same branching tree of arteries getting down to capillaries. And with that whole area that is supplied by that, that tree of, of blood vessels and capillaries is totally dependent on that blood vessel. When that blood vessel gets blocked off, the stroke occurs. So, you know, unfortunately, dementia can be really disappointing. You know, the blood vessel, you know, somebody that has dementia, you could talk them into, be, into being on a plant-based diet, uh, maybe treat their cholesterol. Yeah, that might help slow the progression some. Uh, it it can, really can heal those blood vessels, but dementia can be really disappointing because a lot of what you're seeing in that person's behavior may be due to permanent damage. You know, strokes, whether they're big or small strokes, um, yeah, that, that brain tissue that's dead is not going to come back. 
the, the things that we're talking about here can be much, much more powerful as prevention. Um, it's really thought that the ideal time for these interventions to occur are starting at age 40 or to 60 before those strokes start happening, before you start losing parts of the brain to blood vessels getting blocked off. And you know, just remember that the atherosclerosis is everywhere. It's not just the heart and the brain. You know, the blood vessels supplying the kidneys, supplying the intestines, supplying the muscles, and, and really every blood vessel in the body, every medium to large blood vessel in the body is affected by this process. And when you hear people that are having a bad diet, oh yeah, their, their stomach doesn't feel good a lot of the time. Yes, sometimes that's because their blood vessels are being blocked off supplying the intestines, just like the, 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 just like the blood vessels supplying the heart are being blocked off. Um, and when they say, gosh, I just feel weak, my muscles ache all the time, you know, a lot of the time that's because the blood vessels, the, because the arteries going to the muscles have that atherosclerosis or have even been clogged off and parts of the muscles are not getting a good blood supply and that's why they're weak or feel bad. So, you know, these are just some of the benefits that are proven for a plant-based diet. You move from a standard American diet to truly totally plant-based diet, you'll decrease your risk of heart attack. And, of heart attack. You'll improve, improve your brain health. You'll greatly decrease your risk of stroke. You'll avoid or reverse type 2 diabetes. You'll lower blood pressure, lose weight, improve your energy, improve your spirits, decrease the risk or slow the progression of colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. There's proof for a few others, I believe. And um, you can prevent or improve osteoporosis. Uh, you know, there's other things that have proof in them. I, I ran a room on the slide. I and mean, there's so many benefits to a plant-based diet. Now, if I've inspired you to try to go and look for some more information, these are some sources. Uh, nutritionfacts.org, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, a lot of what I was talking about, about the plaque rupturing and that, those experiments in that test tube were from a video that's on there called Arterial Acne. Um, he likened it to a, a popping zit where uh, I was a little bit more like a volcano. Um, and uh, Dr. Esselstein, uh, the paper that... Uh, that I was, where those pictures came from was a more recent paper in 2005 or something like that, but it was called A Way to Reverse Coronary Artery Disease. You could research, uh, you could just put that into a search engine and find it. Uh, PCRM.org is a wonderful source for, uh, for getting more information. And um, I, I did just mention again, Dr. Kim Williams, because I used some of his slides uh, and the other photos I, I used that I didn't have reference to were all from Shutterstock, except that one where the plaque ruptured. Um, that's from a talk that was uh, given by Dr. Uh, Dr. Greger. Um, but look, I, I really hope you'll, just the ultimate success would be if we've inspired you to take a new path with regard to your health. Uh, you know, with all those things that a plant-based diet can improve, you know, if you've got a loved one that has dementia or, or is struggling with that and struggling with an uncertain future with that, the most important thing we could do for that person is very often to take care of you. Uh, and to keep you there and fully capable to help them through these these years or months. Um, it, so I, I'd sure welcome you all to join us on the road to better health. You know, Carolyn might talk about it some also, but we've got several programs in the community that we're doing. Um, one is Meatless Monday Montgomery. That's the, the, we've got a couple things that are on Facebook. You could search for these on Facebook. Search for Meatless Monday Montgomery. You'll find our page where we're putting up a live broadcast um, the last Monday of each month at 6 p.m. Our previous broadcasts are available on there. We're kind of excited because we're kind of moving up in the world and future broadcasts are going to have improved video and audio. Uh, this is a program that was previously once a month at Whole Foods Grocery Store. We'll hopefully return there in the near future um, as soon as COVID goes away. Another great program that Carolyn is participating in is called So Many 
cooks in the kitchen, so many cooks in the kitchen. Um, that's also a Facebook page where you can catch some of the older broadcasts. Um, it's also a program on the plant-based network. The plant-based network is a wonderful resource, but if you put, um, if you just open your network browser, uh, put open your web browser and you put in plant-based network, uh, it'll guide you towards getting onto the plant-based network. When I did that, it, it guided me to get an app on my phone or something. And if you look down there on their cooking shows, you'll find so many cooks in the kitchen. Uh, Carolyn is featured in the second episode. She's actually showing you some good dishes, a really, really wonderful dish for having beans for breakfast. Another thing we have going on is Veg Out, which is a once a month meeting down at the Eat South downtown farm. Um, and we are meeting at the farm in person when the weather is good enough for us to spread really far out. But if the weather's bad, because we don't want to all crowd up into the greenhouse down there, uh, we'll be doing it on Zoom. But you could go to the Veg Out Montgomery Facebook page to see what, how we're doing at that time. And then Carolyn, you see she's at the Y right now. Yeah, she's teaching some Food for Life classes at the Y. They're getting geared up to where... Uh, She's doing one, I believe, once a month going forward, and uh, we'd love to have you all participate, and you could contact the YMCA to join in. So, yeah, I hope uh, learning a little bit about how heart attacks happen and how you might avoid them. I, I hope it's given you some inspiration, and I hope it sets you on a path towards better health in the future. Um, thank you, Jeremy. Hi, I'm Carolyn Strickland, and I'm a Food for Life instructor with the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. I'm also a graduate of the Cornell Center for Nutrition Studies and a certified plant-based chef. So today what I want to talk about is something that we call bowls. And at our house, we like to eat out of big bowls, these big, deep, comforting bowls. Um, Typically, a bowl will have something like brown rice and maybe some black beans, um, maybe some sautéed vegetables um, and some greens. We always find something green to cook for our dinner. So whether that's kale or collard greens or mustard greens or spinach, you know, some kind of green. So today what we're doing, instead of the brown rice, you could also use quinoa, um, but today instead of that, we're actually using grits. And I've already cooked the grits. I'm gonna to talk to you about that really fast. So this is Bob's Red Mill brand, corn grits, also known as polenta. Um, so if you know any Northerners who tell you, I don't like grits, but then they like polenta, you can tell them it's the exact same thing. So if you've ever cooked grits and then had leftovers and put them in the refrigerator and they get kind of firm, that's polenta. So it's the exact same thing. Um, you could use Bob's Red Mill, you could use a local, granary for your grits. These are some stone ground grits from Oakview Farms. Um, you could use faster cooking grits if you want to. Um, it depends on the kind of grits you have, whether you need four cups of water to one cup of grits or three cups of water to one cup of grits. It just depends on the kind you're using. Use your favorite. It doesn't matter. But instead of using water with your grits, use vegetable broth. And you can use low sodium vegetable broth. So I've used a plant-based chicken flavored broth today and you're going to cook them according to the package directions let them get smooth and creamy and I've already got those cooked here so they're smooth and creamy and then I added in a fourth cup of and this is enough to make four servings so I did a fourth cup of nutritional yeast which has a very nice cheesy flavor. It is not brewer's yeast, it is not baker's yeast. It is a deactivated yeast, it won't make anything rise, and it has a delicious cheesy flavor. So I added a fourth cup of this, and some fresh cracked pepper over it, and that's gonna give us nice, savory, creamy, delicious grits. You could also have these for breakfast if you want, but we're having this for lunch today. So they're beautiful, they smell fabulous. And then I have already cooked two sweet potatoes. What I did was take a purple sweet potato and an orange sweet potato. So when you cut them open, you see the difference. So a couple of 
pieces of the orange sweet potato. They're cut in three quarter to one inch chunks. And then the purple sweet potato, that beautiful purple color, lots of nutrients in sweet potatoes, lots of fiber, lots of vitamin C, lots of vitamin A. So definitely include sweet potatoes in your diet. They're excellent for you. And then all I did was toss them with a little bit of vegetable broth and then sprinkle them with a little bit of iodized sea salt, some fresh cracked pepper, and a little um, onion powder and garlic powder. And then they've already been roasted. So I'll show you that. So they've already been roasted and they're nice and tender, 400 degrees for about 20 minutes. And then I'm just keeping them warm with a little foil over them while we cook the other ingredients of our dish. So we're going to do chickpeas today with barbecue sauce. So one can of chickpeas drained, and you could, if you want to, cook them yourself, so it'll be about a cup and a half. I'm putting those in the pan, and about two thirds of a cup of barbecue sauce. And then we're just gonna let that get nice and warm. Yum. Okay, and the barbecue sauce I'm using today is, you could make your own homemade barbecue sauce if that's what you prefer. I am using Stubbs Original. And I do not know anybody at Stubbs. I'm just <laughs> saying that I like this kind because Stubbs Original only has five grams of sugar in it. And that is one of the lowest amounts of sugar I've ever seen in a commercial barbecue sauce. So if you don't make your own and you can keep the sugar low, most barbecue sauces that you buy commercially are going to have 10 to 12, sometimes even 15 grams of sugar in a serving. So Stubbs Original has only five, which, and it's really tasty. So I like that one. Um, and while that's warming up, we get that nice and warm. And then we're going to do some collard greens. Okay, so in the South, I know that Southern cooks like to cook collard greens for a really, really long time, like hours. But, I, you know, there's reasons behind that. But one of the big reasons is that people were busy and had other things to do while the collard greens were cooking, so they just let them cook all day while they went off and got other things done. But collard greens are one of the most nutritious, high in fiber, high in calcium foods you can eat. In fact, this has, one serving has almost all your daily requirements of calcium. So if you eat a serving of collard greens with some beans, especially, you're gonna get all the calcium you need. It's an amazing amount of calcium. So what we're doing is taking the center hard rib out so the hard woody part at the top, we're going to get rid of because that's super hard and fibrous. So that will go. And then I'm just gonna cut that main part out, maybe down to just where it gets more tender and really flexible. And we'll go ahead and add that into, into our regular um, portion of the collards. But what I like to do with the stems, I took all the other stems from the other collards that I cut up and I, cut, I diced them up. We're still using the stems, lots of good fiber in there. And then we're just dicing it up. That got a little woody right there. Okay, so we're dicing that up into nice tiny little pieces. We're gonna put the stems and a half of an onion I just use a regular yellow onion, half of an onion. It's about half a cup to three fourths of a cup. Put that in the frying pan. Notice I haven't put any oil in because oil does not have any nutrients in it. So oil is empty calories. Um, and a couple cloves of garlic minced up. We'll add that. And then a little bit of vegetable broth just to keep it from sticking. Okay. So you can see, if you want to tilt the camera down, that it's, it is cooking in here with just a little vegetable broth. So the difference between cooking with vegetable broth or water and cooking with oil is that with oil, things are going to get really crispy. Um, and I know that tastes good, but it has very little nutritional value to add to it. And we want to keep things as high in nutrients as we can. So we are cooking up the onions, the garlic, and the collard stems. So sometimes I cook up onions, garlic, and collard stems, and then let it get thoroughly cooked through, starting to brown a little bit, and set it aside and sprinkle it over the top of a dish. This time, though, I'm going to use it in the collards. All right, 
so that's starting to get nice and cooked. You just want to get the onions to start softening and the collard green stems to start to cook through so they're not so crunchy. There we go. So they're starting to get cooked and that garlic smells really good. I'm going to grab a spoon and we'll check on our chickpeas and see how they're doing. So they're getting warm. We just want to warm them through because a can of chickpeas is already cooked. That's already cooked chickpeas. So we're just warming them through. And they can just start, keep heating while you're cooking the collard greens. We'll just keep them going and getting nice and warm. All right, so our collards, our collard stems, onions and garlic are starting to go. Ooh, they look really good. Okay, and it smells fabulous. I wish we had smell-o-vision so you could smell how good this smells. There's my little dog behind me, my helper in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, so those are starting, they're starting to have a few little brown spots on them. So cutting collars, I already cut the stem out of this one. So you can see it's still kind of attached by some of the stem in the middle. So I'm just gonna cut it in half. And then I have some others I already cut up. And so I have about four leaves, but you could take six or eight, stack them on top of each other like this, and then roll them up into a nice tight little roll, like that. And then take a sharp knife carefully <laughs> and cut long ways down the collars and then slice little slices off. So we're gonna have strips of collards. Get one more slice long ways, and then little strips of collards, and it cuts them into these nice little ribbons. So I've already cut up a whole batch of collards over here. Okay, and then I'm just going to add them to the pan. with some more vegetable broth. Turn that down and just let it simmer. So with greens, you don't want to cover the greens with a lid. And the reason is, as greens are cooking, and this is any greens, kale is the same way, um, spinach, Swiss chard, any of the greens that you might want to cook for supper. Um, when they're cooking, they're releasing steam that comes up and it contains some of the acids that you find in the greens. And so if they have a lid over them, those acids will come up, hit the bottom of the lid, and then drip back down onto the greens. And that's gonna turn your greens yellow before you want them to. So we don't want them to turn yellow, we want them to stay nice and green and beautiful. And then I know that a lot of people really like to put meat in their collars, but we are eating a whole food plant-based diet. So this means no meat or animal products. And so we can give it a really delicious meaty flavor by adding some liquid smoke, just a few drops of liquid smoke, or a few sprinkles of smoked paprika, which is a fabulous spice. You're gonna find that at pretty much any grocery store. Um, I've never looked for it at Walmart, but I know Publix has it. I'm pretty sure Winn-Dixie has it. I know Whole Foods has it. Um, okay, and this is beautiful and bright green. Also some fresh dried thyme, or even um, fresh thyme. So, fr sorry, fresh or dried thyme um, is a really nice addition to collard greens. All right. So that's starting to look just beautiful. And you can see it's still bright, bright green. It hasn't turned yellow. And yes, you can eat collard greens after they've only been cooked for just a few minutes. You do not have to wait until they've cooked for hours, until you've cooked all the nutrients out of them. So you wanna keep those nutrients in there. And the longer you cook them, the more they're going to lose the nutrients that you were eating them for in the first place. So 
And I know my dog is scratching at the door <laughs> trying to go get water, so I'm gonna let her out there in just a second. Okay, so I just wanna show you what we're doing with this. We're going to take a bowl and add some of our delicious grits to it. About a fourth of that, this is enough for four people. So about a fourth of the grits in the bowl and some of the collard greens, about a fourth of those collard greens right there on one side. And then some of the sweet potatoes. And then get some of the delicious barbecue chickpeas. If you don't like chickpeas, you could use pinto beans. You could use black beans. Um, pintos probably would go really well with barbecue sauce as well. Chickpeas just have a nice, thick, meaty texture to them. So I really like using chickpeas. And then there you have it. We have this beautiful bowl with the base of... of polenta or grits. Um, it's, it's grits in the south. So grits and some collards, some nice roasted sweet potatoes, and some barbecued chickpeas. It's a delicious, creamy, warming bowl of yummy goodness. It is absolutely fabulous. fabulous. And I am going to send the recipe so that will be posted on the website. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely delicious. You could add maybe just a little bit of sliced avocado, some microgreens on top if you want to, maybe drizzle some more barbecue sauce over the whole thing, but absolutely delicious. So I hope you give it a try. And remember, you can trade out things like if you don't like grits, use brown rice. If you don't like collards, use kale. If you don't like chickpeas, you could use pinto beans. Um, you could throw in some sauteed peppers and onions. That would be really good too. So play with it, go ahead and Give it a try, and I hope you really like it. That was amazing, and I can um, I can confirm for me that it's grits. So, <laughs> so I'll definitely stick with grits myself. And I, I think that would be a fabulous addition, even like you said with quinoa. I definitely need to try that out too. It looks like we had a question come through. It says, if on plant-based diet for years, HDL over 100 and daily exercise, LDL is still high, and overall cholesterol is 205. What to do? Plus, is high HDL really a benefit for older women? Have her not as protective as once thought. Thanks. So I'm going to let you, I'm going to give you the floor there, Dr. Strickland. Well, I, I'm not so sure that it's, it's so much that HDL cholesterol is not protective. It, it's the big thing that came out that really swayed my practice and uh, of most physicians, I think, was called the Prove It Trial where I mean, before the Prove It trial, I, I was like a lot of doctors. I was really enthusiastic about uh, treating, for, uh, treating HDL cholesterol. In people that had a low HDL cholesterol, I was really quick to use medicines like niacin and niacin. Um, it's, it's amazing to think back on all the sweating and flushing that I was causing in people and and how we were riding that out and trying to find ways to deal with it because niacin was our medicine that was the best at raising the HDL cholesterol. Um, we, because we knew that people with higher HDL cholesterols tended to do better, we really thought that we were doing the right thing. But they finally did the Prove It trial, which was really disappointing and really practice changing for a lot of us. Um, the Prove It trial showed that even that niacin did not decrease heart attack and stroke risk so much. Uh, so I was like a lot of people, I stopped using it. But it's still really nice to have a high HDL cholesterol. I think that's in your favor when you have a high HDL cholesterol. Now you're, um, but, but we just don't treat with medicines for it. And if you see a rise in HDL cholesterol from improvements in your diet, I think that's in your favor. Now, your other, the other part of your question with regard to the LDL cholesterol, uh, you know, you, I, I, I very often in my practice, you know, return to the serenity prayer over and over and over again, where you're trying to, to recognize that there's some things that you cannot change, that you can't make a difference with, and trying to focus on taking control of the things that you can change. 
there are some people that have, you know, are just really unfortunate with their genetic makeup that they've got some really weak enzymes for processing cholesterol. And for some of those people, regardless of how good their diet is, they will have a high, high LDL cholesterol and, and an increased risk for heart attack and stroke. Now, you, most of these people can really improve it if you really go all the way to your diet being fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, water, but it won't be perfect for everybody. Uh, what to do in that situation, you can add medicines, uh, particularly the statins. If it's still high despite taking the statins, uh, you could, even at a high dose, then you could, if the LDL cholesterol is still high, you could add another medicine called ezetimib. Um, as you're trying to figure out whether or not going down that path of adding medicines and extra medicines is right for you, you could consider the guidelines from the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association. Um, if you put in ACC, AHA, guidelines for cholesterol or coronary artery disease you'd you'd i think you'd get to their guidelines it's like a 50 page document now one thing that's really important in those guidelines is a heart attack and stroke risk calculator where you could put in your cholesterol numbers your age whether or not you smoke um your gender your i, I think it's um no also has what has a racial distinction in there too uh, but that'll uh, end your blood pressure. And based on those, it'll give you a calculated risk of you having a heart attack in the next 10 years. And they give you some guidance as to how much risk probably warrants going on to additional medication. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, control what you can control. Try to accept what you can't. Uh, not let it get you down too much. Go as far as you can with the things you can control. Number one, diet. Number two, what medications you take. And if you need to refer back to Dr. Strickland's answer, of course, like we've already mentioned a few times, we're recording this, so we'll have this on our YouTube channel for you to refer back to. I don't see any other questions, Jennifer. I don't think there's any comments on our Facebook video as well. So uh, we're going to move along pretty quickly to get you guys out of here. Uh, first and foremost, thank Dr. Strickland and uh, Ms. Carolyn for coming on to do another awesome demonstration. Uh, I was I, I found myself wondering what the uh, what the next meal would be with that spaghetti squash behind you. So uh, maybe maybe we'll get you guys back on soon to do that because I know I know I love a good spaghetti squash every now and then. So, uh, but we'll we'll move on to uh, M4A and this is going to be very quickly. I mean, we, we typically go over M4A with every every one of our coffee breaks, but we're going to do it pretty quickly today. But in short. M4A is the Alabama Area Agency on Aging that covers five counties in the central part of the state. We are a network of 13 other, or excuse me, 12 other local area agencies on aging that co cover kind of the same core services across the state, but uh, simply put our missions to empower individuals, people living with disabilities, and their caregivers to self-advocate as well as live independently and safely in the communities of, of their choice. Our tagline is assisting all ages, at all stages, we cover uh, Blount County, Chilton County, St. Clair, Shelby, and Walker, as well as Jefferson County for our senior employment program. But in short, we have what's called an ADRC, where you can call to get screened for services and benefits. They will, uh, you can also go do that by going through our uh, online portal, m4a.org forward slash referral to kind of get things started. And that will redirect you, of course, to our ADRC to get screened for some of the services that we offer uh, ranging from nutrition services to caregiver supportive services to long-term care support to everything that we do in-house and there's quite a bit of things that we do so we've even got some services here you see that aren't some of our traditionally funded resources through some of our federal and, and state funding but we do more of a, a kind of a grassroots local local type uh, funding but we have a lot of programs and really the best way to get started is to either visit us online again at www m4a.org or you can call us at 205-670-5770 to kind of get the ball started. We do have a numerous amount of uh, really just the major uh, social media accounts. Again, we're recording this. We'll have it on YouTube. So if you've joined us late, we'll have that up probably within the next few days, but at least by next Tuesday at the latest. So just look for that. Subscribe to our account. You can also follow us on uh, Facebook is really our most popular account that we use the most. We put these 
on YouTube, of course. And then when you go to our website, we do have a newsletter. If you're interested in joining that, we do that through MailChimp. So if you have any, uh, you know, if there are any events or anything happening in our region or resources, we try to always include some, some important information that goes out weekly. Uh, there again is our contact information if you need to reach us directly. And we do wanna announce that we do have Again, if you're joining us for Coffee Break the first time, traditionally, we, we, we traditionally had these twice a week, or excuse me, twice a month, and we've cut that back to just once a month now, so that will be the last Wednesday of each month, unless something changes. But for right now, uh, that will be March the 31st, and we are going to be focusing on social isolation, since that's Social Isolation Awareness Month, and we are really excited. We're going to be joined by two of our partners that we kind of work as far as resources, and that is Joy for All as well as Well Connected. And, um, they're gonna be bringing us information on social isolation, how to combat it, and maybe some tools that they have, including companion pets that are uh, in short robotic pets, as well as some enrichment and supporting uh, su support well-being programs through Well Connected that are both uh, national programs. So we're excited to have them. I think Jennifer is throwing in the, the chat. Oh, I just actually raised my hand. I think Jennifer just put the RSV link for the next coffee break. So if you want to grab that real quick, or if, if not, just make sure that you kind of monitor our social media feeds. Once we, we should have this event on our Facebook page up within the next few days. So we'll have the registration link on there and you're more than welcome to go ahead and kind of go ahead and get registered for it. So you do it while it's on your mind so that it reminds you going in to the end of next month because we'll, it'll be here before we know it. So that's all that we have. For you guys today again if you have any suggestions if you have any topics that you think would be great on coffee break feel free to send those to panda at m4a.org again we really want to thank dr strickland as well as miss carolyn for coming on and teaching us something that's really beneficial for each of us regardless of our walk in life and thank you again for i wish we had smell -o vision because it, it sure looked like it smelled good <laughs> so uh thank you again thank you again and i hope that everyone has a great week and like I said, just make sure you follow us on social media. We will have this video posted very soon and feel free to share it, uh, to use any of the links as far as Dr. Strickland and uh, Ms. Carolyn's events that they host down in the Montgomery area. And uh, feel free to reach out with them directly. So we will see you guys next month. Have a great rest of the week and a great weekend. Stay safe. Thank you. Take care.